Trump and Clinton choose Michigan to make economic pitches as the presidential race takes another bizarre turn, plus paying for education and the Olympics. It's my week, and we start right now. Did you know Roush Enterprises was selected by Google to assemble a test fleet of 100 prototype self-driving cars in 2015. It also produced the new Domino's delivery cars. And speaking of Domino's, Domino sells well over 2 million pizzas per day around the world, and half of their sales are digital. These are just some of the ways Michigan's pioneers started out as small companies with big ideas. We are business leaders for Michigan. We are committed to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Funding is also provided by Delta. Hey there, welcome to My Week. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm Christy McDonald. Of all the states to make a case for their plans about jobs and the economy, both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton have chosen Michigan. First, Trump tried to reset his campaign with a hard-hitting economic speech on Monday at the, in Detroit at the Econ Club. And now Hillary Clinton speaking in Warren today about jobs and manufacturing to cement support from those Reagan Democrats in Macomb County. It's pretty significant for both campaigns to make statements here. We'll talk about why that is. Plus, Trump's reboot on Monday imploded loaded with highly inflammatory remarks regarding Clinton and the Second Amendment, and a third party releases Clinton emails raising questions about the foundation and State Department overlap. We are going to start here tonight with our contributors. You know Nolan Finley from the Detroit News, and also joining us is Nancy Kaffer, columnist for the Detroit Free Press. She is in for Stephen Henderson, who is on vacation this week. Uh, it's great to have you back here, Nancy, as always. Oh, it's great to be here. Christine. All right, Nolan, let's start this off. You know, I thought we were just going to be able to sit here this week and talk about the economic plans from both of these candidates and size them up and then everything just totally took a left turn a right turn now, why would you ever think that you know what seriously can I just have one quiet week in the summertime you know it won't make you think anything for, was going to be normal this summer for commentary can we just all gently beat our heads against the table is that is that acceptable I mean seriously you guys must be working guns. you guys must guns be working be overtime um, on the presidential cycle because just when you think well we might want to just ease into this well week, here's it, the it, thing it hasn't totally really changed. it's not not supposed to really start again. We're supposed to get to Labor Day before <laughs> it kicks off. Did you know that a man scaled Trump Tower with suction cups yesterday? We got are, to the 21st floor. We, we are, we are Olympic so sport. far off the grid here. Like, I don't even know what's going to happen. Shouldn't that next. be an Olympic sport, though? It could be it probably, an Olympic that looks sport. So much, but they're not. That was, that was a lot more exciting to watch than gymnastics. I mean, we could do some kind of correlation I, between the suction cup thing I, and the whole cupping therapy. I, mean, I stayed at work for 20 minutes. Doing. I stayed at work awful. for 20 minutes. I didn't have to to watch that guy climb. You got sucked in. That's like watching cat <laughs> videos on YouTube, Nancy. All right, all right. Let's 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 start this off with because we have a, a lot of time to talk about what's been happening with the presidential race. But I do want to start off first with the mm -hmm. significance of Michigan and the fact that both candidates have chosen Michigan of all places to make their um, to kind of rebrand their economic their economic pictures for the country. So let me start with you, Nolan, and tell me why Michigan. Why well, did you know, they that's a here? question I ask because you know I don't think Michigan is really a swing state. So there are other states that are more in play and you, you would have thought particularly for Donald Trump and for Clinton if, if you're going to make a, announcements like this you go to a Florida perhaps or a Pennsylvania uh, a, a, or an, even in Indiana a place that's in play I don't think Michigan is in play this year but in terms of economic issues Michigan's been through it all over the years and so I, I think um, they felt that this was a good place to talk particularly about uh, manufacturing and 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 business taxes and and other things but uh, it is curious to me that they both chose Michigan instead of uh, picking other states where th th might do them more good why do you think I, they did that Nancy I mean I, I agree I don't think Michigan's in play I think that if Michigan were in play we would be saying <laughs> Hillary Clinton would have a lot bigger problems um, but it, it I I think that one of the reasons we're seeing Michigan is because Detroit some people have this sort of, on the, on the right side of the aisle, have this sort of Detroit fetish where they like to hold it up as this example of failed liberal and democratic policies. And we saw this in even Bernie Sanders bringing it up, um, you know, pointing to NAFTA as the cause of Detroit's woes. And, and you know, if you look at Detroit's decline, it started right after World War II and it had to do with, uh, with uh, 
companies spreading out to the suburbs. It had to do with, with federal housing policy um, designed to incentivize home ownership, but programs that kept African Americans out of home ownership, that depleted the tax base, both business and residential of the city. It, it started while Detroit still had Republican mayors and uh, continued during Detroit's you know, famous 50 years of Democratic leadership. Um, it, it's far more complex than saying liberal policies have failed Detroit, but because of Detroit's very high profile um, you know, fall and then what we hope is, is comeback, um, I, think that it, I think that that is part of the draw here, is to be able to point to Detroit and, and try to make some grand point about the economy. It may be the trade issue um, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, both of them are basically preaching the same message on trade and that's a message that resonates in a manufacturing particularly an auto manufacturing state like Michigan uh, I mean it's an it's an ill-considered uh, policy by both Trump and Clinton but I think they thought that trade here and since trade was such a big centerpiece that both mm -hmm. their talks were expected to be, that that would play well. I think, it's, I think it's interesting, too, that you, you make the point, Nolan, and I'm sure, Nancy, you would agree, that this that Michigan is no longer a swing state. I, right, I, right, I, that, yeah. you know, we haven't, the state hasn't voted for a Republican president since... 1992. Thank you. So um, the fact that Michigan's like, well, we could still be in play here is really not, it doesn't seem to be accurate. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I don't think we're in play. I don't think that... Uh, I, I agree with Nolan. Watch out for the lightning. Um, but yeah, I was going to say, I just wrote that down and the time that that happened. Idiot. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, 1992 was when they first we started going mm -hmm. blue. We've so. gone blue in every election since 1992. Thank you, Nolan. Um, but I... But I... Oh, no, I totally lost my, no, I totally lost my train of thought. No, but um, Detroit, election... Nolan, you talk. All right, no. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I the think polls, <laughs> our poll last week, and I, th I think the subsequent free press poll confirms that... Um, you know, this isn't a swing state. Probably never was a swing state. We talked about if it, this was going to be a swing state, Romney would have won it four years Absolutely. ago. Absolutely, Romney, home, home And grown. so he didn't, you know, he didn't win it by a lot. And yet every year we start out with this Michigan's competitive. And, and it's it, it's good for us to think that because we get a lot more tension, a lot more... You get a lot more ad time, time too. And a lot so, more, yeah. more money spent. And I think Sanders' victory in the Democratic primary mm -hmm. here is fueling some of this belief here because Sanders did uh, make this, this criticism that NAFTA had been, you know, they, they were... his supporters were tweeting this meme of, of showing an abandoned house in Detroit and saying this is what Hillary Clinton and NAFTA did for you, which is not, I mean, by the time NAFTA came around, Detroit was was not, uh, you know, really in, in the in the line here to be affected by it. But it, uh, it uh, you know, I think because that issue seemed to give Bernie, track, Bernie Sanders some traction in the, in the primary, I think that's probably fueling the idea that there is a uh, push here on this issue. Well, let's talk a little bit about Donald Trump and his speech at the Econ Club this mm -hmm. week. Uh, both of you were there. Um, Nolan, talk to me a little bit about the atmosphere. I mean, much was made that this was a huge speech for Donald Trump to reset his campaign and to show a I can be presidential performance out of him. What was your take from Well, I mean, sitting there watching the speech, I mean, I think he hit his, I mean, aside from the particulars of, of the speech, some of which I agreed with very much, others I'm very much opposed to, but aside from the particulars of the speech, I thought he did a good job with composure, demeanor, tone. He wasn't, you know, sort of off the cuff attacking. He you know, he needed to go in there and look presidential, and I think he accomplished that. And then, you know, as always, when it comes to his resets, he walks off the stage, starts, you know, making these wild off-the-cuff comments, getting on Twitter, and, you know, he, and he gives back any advantage he might have gained, and he did that again this week. Uh, yeah, you know, I think because of confirmation bias, we see, um, and I have to compliment Nolan on a really great column this weekend where he talked about how the GOP has shifted away from what he and other um, con you know, real conservatives believe. I think that was a great column, Nolan. Thank very, you. Uh, everyone should read it if they haven't already. But, um, you know, so we we see, though, there are, there are Republicans who have said to me, uh, oh, I just don't know what I'm going to do in this election. I want to believe he's going to settle down. He'll hire good people um, and, and that Trump will be able to become presidential and that this is sort of a persona. Despite by this time, so much evidence that, that that's not really a, a credible scenario. And because of confirmation bias, which, which is the natural trait to, to weight information that, that confirms what you want to believe heavily, more heavily than information that con contradicts what you want to believe, mm -hmm. people will point to speeches like Monday's uh, Econ Club speech and say, um, oh, well, see, he's able to do it when he, when he 
wants to and look at things like Tuesday and say, oh, that doesn't count. Um, that's, and so I think that there is a group of Republicans who will be, despite his um, returning to true form um, the day after, mm -hmm. will uh, will find us reassuring. I think it is interesting. They I, don't also, know how, um, you, I don't know how you, I don't know how, how you make a case otherwise to those folks either. Well, I, mean, I, think I think you're talking about surrounding himself with people and mm -hmm. uh, former uh, Michigan Congressman Mike Rogers is one of those names that uh, mm -hmm. popped up. Um, but then you have this whole group of people, you know, 50 uh, leaders that have come out, former CIA, and uh, saying, look, this guy is not fit to lead. Yeah, and I mean, you and you. No matter who that, you surround him with. You have that growing feeling amongst the um, Republican establishment. I feel that same way myself. Haven't been shy about saying that, but um, you know, you, I, I, the response from that column for me Sunday was very interesting. I got hundreds and hundreds of emails from people who say, you know, I'm where you are. I can't vote for either one. We don't want to sit here and pretend it's only Dem uh, Republicans who are dismayed by this election. Tremendous number of, of Democrats uh, wrote me as well saying, you know, I just don't trust her. I can't vote for someone I, I don't trust. I'm going to sit it out. And I'm really thinking you're going to see a very low, perhaps not turnout at the polls, but a very low ballot casting uh, on the presidential line. What do you think that that says, Nancy? Well, um, I think we have to find out if that happens before I can have an opinion yeah. on it. I think that there is a lot. This is an election. I haven't seen as many elections as, as Nolan, but this is definitely an election unlike any in my lifetime. Um, I mean, we're really in. The thing that concerns me the most about this election is um, we've had candidates, it's standard operating procedure for a candidate to say, the other guy's incompetent, they don't know what they're doing, I'm, I'm, I'm the one who can fix this, this is the, the other guy is, is well, a will destroy is a the mess. country. Right. <laughs> but that, that's standard. But to say, the system is rigged, the system is corrupt, the country is, is, a, is uh, this election is rigged, that's stuff that only Trump has, that's there, even Richard Nixon with his very, uh, you know, mm -hmm. law and order fear-mongering speech in 68, didn't say the country is corrupt and the system is rigged. Well, maybe but we don't have you more think confirmation that's... bias there. If you listen to Elizabeth Warren and Hillary Clinton and, you, you know, this, and the sort of increasing use of, of Nazi references that are creeping but, in, I think that's all no. very dangerous. I don't think there's a you know, a high ground in this election now, on either now side. Bernie it's low ground. Bernie Sanders has said that the, the system is rigged, et cetera, and Elizabeth Warren, and, and that's a different, I'm talking about a presidential candidate, someone who is in line to lead the country. And what concerns me about that is that in an outcome um, in which Donald Trump doesn't win, he has spent months telling his supporters that the election is rigged. What are they going to do? Are they going to accept the outcome as legitimate? Uh, well, don't you think that he's saying that as a as a shield, but he's going to lose. Okay. And then, so he can't feel bad about losing because he was never going to win all So, but the, but the thing that, so, I mean, sure, but, but what do his supporters think about that? Do they say, oh, he's saying that so he won't feel bad? Or are they saying, yeah, the system's rigged, and then if he loses, what do they do? So then it goes to, it, it speaks to how much do his supporters really believe what he's saying. And well, we know that the exaggeration factor right. runs high, yeah. and this goes directly to what he said the next day after he made his speech at the Econ Club and talking about the Second Amendment mm -hmm. and Hillary Clinton. Was that a veiled threat? Was that just off-the-cuff speech? And But does that it's make... what you it, never can tell. I mean, exactly. To tell one person somewhere out in the country who takes it literally yeah, and you know we've had that sort of thing in the past on both both sides it's you know it's inappropriate it's overheated rhetoric but what the truth is here with so many people voting against rather than for no matter who wins this presidency the president's going to come into the office uh, lacking the uh, majority support of the American people probably going to get elected with less than 40 percent of the vote and even that 40 percent of the vote that 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 did vote for him and her, um, much of that was cast against the other person rather than for them. I don't see how you unite this country after this. It's a pretty I, depressing I, thought. I, I share that concern. I mean, you have a significant portion of the country that will not accept the outcome as legitimate, regardless of how it falls. And um, and I think that puts us in, uh, you know, the, the one thing, um, one difference I think is that Hillary Clinton, whether you love her or hate her, is is a is a nerd, and she's got detailed plans for basically everything. And I bet that somewhere she has a plan, whether it will be successful or she, not, for how she would unite the country. I don't think Donald Trump even thinks that way. I, have no I, mean, idea. I don't think he, I don't think that's even something he thinks I mean, about how will I unite the country. These, I don't know these, if she's going to be able to do it. These candidates are deeply flawed in different yeah. ways. I wouldn't wouldn't agree that if you just look at her her resume and experience, you'd say that's a qualified candidate. And then again, you have these more emails creeping out yesterday, you know, showing that sort of 
ethical line she walks with the collusion between the Clinton Foundation and the State Department in clear violation of the agreements that the Obama, the ethical agreements the Obama administration put in place to guard against just this sort of thing. I mean, lobbying, you had the Clinton Foundation people lobbying the State Department on behalf of donors. Um, the president was worried about this when he named her, and so he put these guys' in, in place, and she completely blew by them from day one. One thing that I want to look at side by side is in this election, people seem to have given Donald Trump a lot more credence when it comes to helping the economy and to um, growing mm -hmm. the economy and bringing jobs, uh, you know, to America. He's done, that's the one place where it feels like he's done pretty well. Um, what would um, Hillary Clinton's plans versus Donald Trump's plans look like and how would that affect Michigan? Let me start with you, Nancy. Well, one of the things we saw from Trump on Monday was um, he started off by kind of giving what sort of is a standard conservative stump, stump mm -hmm. speech. He's going to cut business taxes. He's going to freeze regulations. He's going to he's going to make it easier for people to start businesses. He didn't give really any details. He kept saying details. Uh, details will give you details in the coming weeks. It's mm -hmm. like, well, you know, the election is in the coming weeks. So let's get those details. But um, th this is a very standard, very, you know, traditional uh, sort of sort of conservative side of the aisle promises. Um, then, toward the end of the speech, he started going into sort of this rapid fire uh, litany of, of policy things, you know, and one and within the space of one or two sentences was like, we're going to improve law and order and we're going to help with child care costs. I mean, this, it, it became, it started off as a very um, more traditional kind of campaign speech and devolved into a, a very um, almost um, frenetic <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, recitation of policy prescriptions. I don't, you know, I don't. I don't think he provided enough detail to flesh out how um, any of those plans are going to are going to help Michigan. What do you think, Nolan? The speech got good marks from um, economists. I walked out with one of the automotive economists on Monday, and he said it's a fine speech. It's everything we would want, except the trade mm -hmm. stuff really concerns us. It really concerns me. One thing he didn't mention. Uh, that I think is very important to Michigan and every other state, and she won't mention today, we take before her yeah. speech, obviously, is debt and deficit. And you have not heard that conversation throughout this campaign. And the, I think the American people are worried or should be worried that we are, continue to spend a third more than we take in in this country. And nobody's talking about that. Instead, he proposed massive new spending programs. She'll propose massive new, net massive new spending programs. All well and good, but you should lay out a plan, a real plan, um, beyond this fantasy that we're going to soak the rich, a real plan for paying for it. And we just keep proposing spending without pr proposing trade-offs, budget trade-offs. Are you missing those details? Um, I think that I actually take a slightly different approach to this than Nolan. I think that um, debt is uh, only one part of a fraction and that I... The, the you know one way to attack debt is to cut, but another way to attack debt is to grow the other part of the fraction. So you know well, that's if, true. If your if your economy grows and if the plans that you're putting in place that have an immediate cost result in economic growth that puts your debt into a, a stable situation, that's you know and that's kind and of that, the approach. I That's prefer. absolutely true. You can do that to a point, but you can't just mm -hmm. keep spending, spending, spending. There's a limit to how much even growth can cover, and you have to remember we've got a tremendous amount. Well, Twenty trillion dollars in debt we've got to address mm -hmm. too, okay. and you know I don't see the enough growth in well, either I mean, one of the plans I also to think cover that, the debt. I also think that any kind of discussion of of debt uh, and budget cutting doesn't really lend itself to the campaign trail because you can't say we're going to cut. Uh, you know, we're going to cut it's Social Security. We're going to we're going to cut. You, do you, you have, you you have to restructure things and be thoughtful about it, and that doesn't lend itself into the sort of quick statements that work. But well you can say we are going to. Um, sure. Restructure our priorities. We're, if we're going to do child care credits, American people may think that's a fine thing. What are we doing that we don't want to do anymore? Oh. That's responsible governing, and I think that's a powerful. Let me ask. Message. Let me ask you this: is, you, is the economy still? Do you believe the number one issue on voters' minds? Our readers said it was in the poll. I think it came out in yours too, didn't it? What do you think? I think uh, I think it's hard to. It, it's hard to argue that it's never the, the top issue. Right. So no. Well, in terms of national security. Well, sure. Yeah, and that's funny because <clears throat> you would you'd think with all that's happening in the world, national security would rise higher. But people are more concerned 
about their own Is household it? incomes. The economy is stupid, right? Well, it's, you know, because uh, there certainly are very real dangers in the world, but, you know, statistically speaking, it's very, very unlikely that they affect you personally. And so the, the, the challenges you deal with every day are, are far so, more real yeah. to you and important. And that's You're natural. There's your, nothing wrong with that. You're worried about your own bills and your kids' and, colleges. And, and ha having that. a stable financial foundation is part of, of national security. It's, it's the thing that every, everything flows from. This is true. All right. Well, you know, it's time now for some headlines. All right, we have a bunch of headlines catching our attention, paying more for education in Michigan and our armchair expertise when it comes to the Olympics. But first, I want to start off with a, a meeting that happened this week with the uh, State Board of Ed. Uh, the State Superintendent, Brian Whiston, uh, talked to them uh, this week and is talking more and more about this study that came out uh, at the end of June that the, that the state mandated that we do, talking about closing the achievement gap and, and the ideal spending amount of money per pupil spending that this study came out and said we should be spending in the exact amount, $8,667. And so the State Superintendent is urging the legislature to, to take this up and, and try to close, close that gap or, or because what we're spending right now is um, between 7,500 and 8,200 per pupil in the state. So, Nancy, let me start with you. Um, what's the over under on what you think the legislature is going to do in terms of a little bit more spending uh, for pupil spending here? Um, I'm not really seeing them go for it. Yeah. But I mean, you know, so the adequacy, the, the adequate education study is fascinating because what the, the firm that was hired to find out what what they did was they looked at districts that were achieving the best results in the state and they, they looked at what those districts were spending. They threw out the top 13 districts that were spending so much that they were outliers and a lot of those are rural districts where um, you know they're not the average school district. Um, so then they looked at the, the state had asked them to look at districts that were performing above the statewide average. Mm -hmm. So this firm looks at districts in the state and they find that only in one subject area are Michigan statewide averages routinely scoring proficient. And so they basically said, this is a kind of a bad standard, because what you're saying is, what does it cost to get you to above the statewide average, even when the statewide average is not satisfactory? Mm -hmm. They said, we're going to make a different criteria. We're going to do that, but we're also going to make a different criteria and look at the schools that are actually top performing um, in that schools are scoring above proficient. And that's where they got this number. Um, you know, you also have the governor who's created this 21st Century Education Commission, mm -hmm. Nolan. Um, how does that play into what the legislature may or may not do or what their fortitude is for changing? anything when it comes to funding. One, one thing the legislature isn't going to do or shouldn't do is put in place funding increases until we've decided on we can all sit down and agree on what education should look like in this state, what education reform, accountability, all those other things that the legislature was charged with doing and hasn't done yet in terms of putting in place school accountability. Uh, it's not going to happen until you get a unified strategy for improving <laughs> schools. If you look at Tennessee, which has made huge gains in, in education over the last few years, they all got behind, every, all the interests in the state got behind the same plan. And here you've got groups that want the money without the reform. You've got the groups that want reform and not the money. We're going to have to get together, and I've said, we've said this at this table before, behind a unified strategy for improving education in the state. And then people will lobby for these funds. All right, last word on this, Nancy. Um, you know, there's so many words to choose from. Um, but one of the things that happened in Tennessee was that they used a bottom-up strategy. It was it was a thing where they worked very collaboratively with, with parents, with, with districts on the local level. It wasn't a statewide uh, top-down solution. But, you know, the other thing is uh, we can say, like, it, it isn't just more money, it isn't just whatever, but um, money sure helps. And we're not talking about, when we talk about poor-performing districts, districts not routinely scoring proficient, about 50% proficient, except in, in one subject area reading. We're not talking about um, large, you know, urban impoverished districts like Detroit or Flint, or we're talking about statewide. We're talking Every about district. communities mm -hmm. that aren't, people tend to think, oh, well, we're not Detroit, we're not such and such, so we don't have these problems. They do. Every demographic right, do. group, every, com every demographic group in this state, every demographic community performs worse, or among the worst in the, in the nation. We are not doing well anywhere. Mm -mm. Um, I agree money would help. But you can't just spend money. You've got to spend money for a purpose. How you spend the money? And we haven't got that plan in well, place Well, let's hope uh, Lansing gets uh, a little bit of a, I don't a, know why a coordinated can, act yeah. together. All right, um, you'll, you'll watch in the Olympics? I am. Nancy, are you watching the Olympics at all? No. No? You mean you're not watching judo? 
um, ping pong. My kids I are getting into the ping say, pong. I wish or, you excuse could me, see table that. tennis. Excuse me. Is I wish you could see that. Is this is this a thing you can say on TV? But I don't have. Uh, I don't. I only have streaming. I don't have TV. That's okay. We have online platforms just for you if you'd like to watch PBS. Uh, you know, <laughs> every night it's the same three sports. I'm getting a little tired of it. I mean, I like the swimming and gymnastics and the volleyball. But over and over and over, I wish they'd, I mean, there's a lot of weird sports in the Olympics that would be fun to watch. Rhythmic gymnastics. We, yes, exactly. Uh, incredibly athletic. Should we we still have the rowing, same passion boxing. as a country for the Olympics is that we did like in the 80s. I think, the, I think NBC is playing it so safe. You know, they, they only want to show us the marquee the sports. The sanitized And then it's over and version. over and over. You, work, you can work in some of these bizarre little sports they do, and I think people would, uh, would enjoy it. Archery was it. on would, this, this morning. When it would have been fun. I would be more excited to watch trap shooting or rhythmic gymnastics it was fun. Than, than, uh, than, I guess, swimming probably. And I, I guess know. there's some off channels if you can find them. You can. It's Bravo, guess, and there's a couple of other shows. I, I, I know. Oh, no, you got to I could, talk, I could talk about gender bias and coverage of female Olympians. Well, you know we, we need another 30 <laughs> minutes for that because I, I do I do hear you I on could, that. I could tell you about this great show, Preacher, I've been binge watching. There's a lot of other stuff. <laughs> We're going to save that for offline. Hey, thanks, <laughs> Nance. It's always good to have you in here. All right, Nolan, we'll see you next week. And that's going to do it for My Week. Glad that you could be with us. Check out myweek.org and Facebook and Twitter. Tell us what you'd like to talk about in an upcoming show. We'll listen to you. Thanks for supporting Detroit Public TV. I'm Christy McDonald, and we'll see you next time for My Week. Take care. Did you know Gordon Food Service was started by a 23-year-old entrepreneur as a butter and egg delivery business more than a century ago? In 1948, school teacher Gerard Wendell Hayworth borrowed $10,000 from his parents to start a woodworking operation in his family's garage. It's now Hayworth Incorporated. These are just some of the ways Michigan's pioneers started out as small companies with big ideas. We are business leaders for Michigan. We are committed to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Funding is also provided by Delta.